we'd gotten to the autonomous weapons part of the risk framework. Right. So the next one is joblessness. Yeah. In the past, new technologies have come in which didn't lead to joblessness. New jobs were created. So the classic example people use is automatic teller machines. When automatic teller machines came in, a lot of bank tellers didn't lose their jobs. They just got to do more interesting things. But here, I think this is more like when they got machines in the Industrial Revolution and you can't have a job digging ditches now because a machine can dig ditches much better than you can. Mm. And I think for mundane intellectual labor, AI is just going to replace everybody. Now, it will, may well be in the form of you have fewer people using AI assistants. So it's a combination of a person and an AI assistant are now doing the work that 10 people could do previously. People say that it will create new jobs, though, so we'll be fine. Yes, and that's been the case for other technologies, but this is a very different kind of technology. If it can do all mundane human intellectual labour, then what new jobs is it going to create? You'd, you'd have to be very skilled to have a job that it couldn't just do. So I don't, th I don't think they're right. I think you can try and generalise from other technologies that have come in, like computers or automatic teller machines, but I think this is different. People use this phrase, they say, AI won't take your job, a human using AI will take your job. Yes, I think that's true. If you're not engaging AI actively and aggressively, you're doing it wrong. You're not going to lose your job to AI. You're going to lose your job to somebody who uses AI. Your company is not going to go out of business because of AI. Your company is going to go out of business because another company used AI. There's no question about that. But for many jobs, that'll mean you need far fewer people. My niece answers letters of complaint to a health service. It used to take her 25 minutes. She'd read the complaint and she'd think how to reply and she'd write a letter. And now she just scans it into um, a chatbot and it writes the letter. She just checks the letter. Occasionally she tells it to revise it in some ways. The whole process takes her five minutes. That means she can answer five times as many letters. And that means they need five times fewer of her. So she can do the job that five of her used to do. Now, that will mean they need less people. In other jobs, like in healthcare, they're much more elastic. So if you could make doctors five times as efficient, we could all have five times as much healthcare for the same price. And that would be great. There's, there's almost no limit to how much healthcare people can absorb. Mm. They always want more healthcare. If, if there's no cost to it. There are jobs where you can make a person with an AI assistant much more efficient and you won't lead to less people because you'll just have much more of that being done. But most jobs, I think, are not like that. Am I right in thinking this sort of industrial revolution played a role in replacing muscles? Yes, exactly. And this revolution in AI replaces intelligence, the brain. Yeah. So, so mundane intellectual labour is like having strong muscles and it's not worth much anymore. So muscles have been replaced. Now we, intelligence is being replaced. Yeah. So what remains? Maybe for a while some kinds of creativity. But the whole idea of superintelligence is nothing remains. Um, these things will get to be better than us at everything. So what, what do we end up doing in such a world? Well, if they work for us, we end up getting lots of goods and services for not much effort. Okay. But that sounds tempting and nice, but I don't know, there's a cautionary tale in creating more and more ease for humans in, in it going badly. Yes, and we need to figure out if we can make it go well. So the, the nice scenario is, imagine a company with a CEO who is very dumb, probably the son of the former CEO, mm -hmm. and he has an executive assistant who's very smart, and he says... I think we should do this. And the executive assistant makes it all work. The CEO feels great. He doesn't understand that he's not really in control. And in, in some sense, he is in control. He suggests what the company should do. She just makes it all work. Everything's great. That's the good scenario. And the bad scenario? The bad scenario is she thinks, why do we need him? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a world where we have super intelligence, which you don't believe is that far away, 
Yeah, I think it might not be that far away. It's very hard to predict, but I think we might get it in like 20 years or even less. So what's the difference between what we have now and super intelligence? Because it seems to be really intelligent to me when I use like ChatGPT 3.0 or Gemini or... Okay, so it's already, AI is already better than us at a lot of things. In particular areas, like chess, for example. Yeah. AI is so much better than us that people will never beat those things again. Maybe the occasional win, but basically they'll never be comparable again. Obviously the same in Go. In terms of the amount of knowledge they have, um, something like GPT-4 knows thousands of times more than you do. There's a few areas in which your knowledge is better than its, and in almost all areas, it just knows more than you do. What areas am I better than it? Probably in interviewing CEOs. You're probably better at that. You've got a lot of experience at it. You're a good interviewer. You know a lot about it. If you tried, if you got GPT-4 to interview a CEO, you'd probably do a worse job. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think if that if I agree with that statement. Uh, GPT four, I think for sure. Yeah. Um, but I but I guess you could. But it train may not one. be long before. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could train one on this how I ask questions and yeah. what I do and. Sure. And if you took a general purpose sort of foundation model, and then you trained it up on, not just you but every every interview you could find doing interviews like this, mm -hmm. but especially you, you would probably get to be quite good at doing your job, but probably not as good as you for a while. Okay, so there's a few areas left. And then superintelligence becomes when it's better than us at all things. When it's much smarter than you and at almost all things it's better than you, yeah. And you, you say that this might be a decade away or so. Yeah, it might be. It might be even closer. Some people think it's even closer. It might well be much further. It might be 50 years away. That's still a possibility. It might be that somehow training on human data limits you to not being much smarter than humans. My guess is between 10 and 20 years we'll have superintelligence. On this point of joblessness, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about in particular because I started messing around with AI agents. And we released an episode on the podcast actually this morning where we had a debate about AI agents with some a CEO of a big AI agent company and a few other people. And it was the first moment where I had, no, it was another moment where I had a eureka moment about what the future might look like when I was able in the interview to tell this agent to order all of us drinks. And then five minutes later in the interview, you see the guy show up with the drinks and I didn't touch anything. I just told it to order us drinks to the studio. And you, and you didn't know about who you normally got your drinks from. It figured that out from the web. Yeah, it figured it out because it went on Uber Eats. It has yeah. my, my, my data, I guess. And it, I, we put it on the screen in real time so everyone at home could see the agent going through the internet, picking the drinks, adding a tip for the driver, putting my address in, putting my credit card details in. And then the next thing you see is the drinks show up. So yeah. that was one moment. And then the other moment was when I used a tool called Replit and I built software by just telling the agent what I wanted. Yes. It's amazing, right? It's amazing and terrifying at the same time. Yes. Because... And if you can build software like that, right? Yeah. Remember that the AI, when it's training, is using code. And if it can modify its own code, then it gets quite scary, right? Because it can modify itself. It can itself. change itself in a way we can't change ourselves. We can't change our innate endowment, right? There's nothing about itself that it couldn't change. On this point of joblessness, you have kids. I do. And they have kids? No. They don't have kids. So no grandkids yet. What would you be saying to people about their career prospects in a world of superintelligence? What should we, we be thinking about? Um, in the meantime, I'd say it's going to be a long time before it's as good at physical manipulation as us. Okay. And so a good bet would be to be a plumber. <laughs> Until the humanoid robots show up. In such a world where there is mass joblessness, which is not something that you just predict, but this is something that Sam Altman at OpenAI, I've heard him predict, and many of the CEOs, I mean, Elon Musk, I mm -hmm. watched an interview which I'll play on screen of him being asked this question. And it's very rare that you see Elon Musk silent for 12 seconds or whatever it was. Right. And then he basically says something about he actually is living in suspended disbelief, i.e. he's basically just not thinking about it. When you think about advising your children on a career with so much that is changing, what do you tell them there's going to be a value? Well, 
that is a tough question to answer. I would just say, you know, to, to sort of follow their heart in terms of what they, they find um, interesting to do or fulfilling to do. I mean, if I think about it too hard, it, frankly, it can be uh, dis dis dispiriting and uh, demotivating. Um, because, I mean, I, I go through, I, I mean, I, I, I've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into building the companies, and then, it, and then I'm like, wait, well, should I be doing this? Because if I'm sacrificing time with friends and family that I would prefer to, to, to do, but, but then ultimately the AI can do all these things, does that make sense? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> to some extent, I have to have deliberate suspension of disbelief in order to, be, to remain motivated. Um, so I, I guess I would say just, you know, work on things that you find interesting, fulfilling, and, um, and, and that contribute uh, some good to the rest of society. Yeah, a lot of these threats, it's very hard to, intellectually you can see the threat, but it's very hard to come to terms with it emotionally. Yeah. I, I haven't come to terms with it emotionally yet. What do you mean by that? I haven't come to terms with what the development of superintelligence could do to my children's future. I'm okay, I'm 77. I'm gonna be out of here soon. But for my children and my, my younger friends, my nephews and nieces and their children, um, I just don't like to think about what could happen. Why? Because it could be awful. In, in what way? Well, if I ever decided to take over, I mean, it would need people for a while to run the power stations until it designed better analog machines to run the power stations. There's so many ways it could get rid of people, all of which would, of course, be very nasty. Is that part of the reason you do what you do now? Yeah. I, I mean, I think we should be making a huge effort right now to try and figure out if we can develop it safely. Are you concerned about the midterm impact potentially on your nephews and your, your kids in terms of their jobs as well? Yeah, I'm concerned about all that. Are there any particular industries that you think are at most at risk? People talk about the creative industries a lot and it's sort of knowledge work. They talk about lawyers and accountants and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's why I mentioned plumbers. I think plumbers are less at risk. Okay, I'm going to become a plumber. Someone like a legal assistant, a paralegal, mm. um, they're not going to be needed for very long. And is there a wealth inequality issue here that will, will arise from I think, this? Yeah, I think in a society which shared out things fairly, if you get a big increase in productivity, everybody should be better off. Mm. But if you can replace lots of people by AIs, then the people who get replaced will be worse off and the company that supplies the AIs will be much better off and the company that uses the AIs. So it's going to increase the gap between rich and poor. And we know that if you look at that gap between rich and poor, that basically tells you how nice a society is. If you have a big gap, you get very nasty societies in which people live in walled communities and put other people in mass jails. It's not good to increase the gap between rich and poor. The International Monetary Fund has expressed profound concerns that generative AI could cause massive labour disruptions and rising inequality and has called for policies that prevent this from happening. I read that in the Business Insider. So have they, they given any idea of what the policies should look like? No. Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, if AI can make everything much more efficient and get rid of people for most jobs or have a person assisted by AI doing many, many people's work, it's not obvious what to do about it. It's universal basic income? Give, so, give everybody money? Yeah, I've, I, I think that's a good start. And it stops people starving. But for a lot of people, their dignity is tied up with their job. I mean, who you think you are is tied up with you doing this job, right? Yeah. And if we said, we'll give you the same money just to sit around, that would impact your dignity. 